Uh, good evening. I am here with uh, Reverend Matthew Nix, who is the pastor at Christ Lutheran Church, Trinity Lutheran of the Deaf, and he's also the Sioux Falls Hospital Chaplain of the South Dakota District. Thanks, Matt, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. You know, uh, we had chatted once before. I remember, I think you're the first person I sat down and had any length of conversation with. We went out to pizza within my being here in Sioux Falls in a couple weeks. And I remember even back then you telling me some interesting things about your route to becoming a pastor. So if you wouldn't mind, that's kind of something that we've been doing with these interviews is giving everybody an opportunity to talk about you know, kind of the Lord's calling, how you came into ministry, maybe what you're doing prior to that. Uh, so tell us, what's your story about uh, becoming a pastor? Okay. Um, have always enjoyed being involved in the church, but never really thought of being a pastor or a church worker. Mm -hmm. When I got out of high school, <coughs> excuse me, I went to college for computer science and accounting, got done with college, had a couple jobs in computer science. My job just prior to leaving to, to the seminary was I was a defense contractor working on operating systems. Wow. And I had just gotten married. My wife was an accounting major. She does not have a church history background. Um, in fact, was baptized the night of our re rehearsal uh, for the wedding. Wow. We get, we get married. I don't want to raise a family in the town that I work in. It was an army post town and just wasn't a place I wanted to raise a family. So we moved about an hour away. We went to church. Um, and I think it was the first Sunday that we were at church. The pastor had a blurb in the bulletin. Anybody interested in sign language? My wife had had deaf friends in high school and in college. So she signed up and just kind of forgot about it. Hold on, everybody. Go ahead. I'll be gone soon. And I think it's about gone. Um, the pastor there quite often would bring up the need for professional church workers. Oh, okay. Uh, kind of dwelled on it a little bit. I thoroughly enjoyed my job. Another one coming through. You know, speaking of that, while the while the plans go through, and I can maybe interject. Hold on. So, so you were doing you were doing church work, or uh, you were doing work as a programmer that whole time, then? Yeah, I was I was a programmer all prior to going to the seminary. So, okay, and yeah. and you you worked quite a ways away from where you were living then. About an hour away. Yeah. And that, and that was intentional because, like I said, we didn't want to raise a family in that town. I didn't mind driving driving the distance, and it just worked out well. But was your pastor wife working quite, too? She did start working as soon as we moved to that town. Um, she was went to work at, as an accountant. Um, but the pastor commented about the need for church workers, and. Finally, one day I came home and told my wife I thought that was what I was supposed to do, I was supposed to go to the seminary. She was not excited, said, go on, have fun. We'll be here when you get back. So I figured that was the last of that for at least quite a while. But sometime after that, the pastor came and told her, notice that you signed up that you had an interest in sign language. Are you still interested? Yes. Are you interested enough to go to Fort Wayne, Indiana for a month this summer? We talked about it. Yes. And about halfway through that program at the Fort Wayne Seminary, we were on the phone, and my being a pastor wasn't the worst idea in the world. <laughs> so we, we started looking and wound up going to St. Louis. And somewhere in the now, registration... Why, you had already gone to Fort Wayne. Why did you decide to go to St. Louis? At that point, um, very honestly, it was more conservative than what I was comfortable with. Also, it was twice the distance from where we live. Okay. And my wife was, was very close with her mother and right. being closer to home was a good thing at that point. To go back again, I would probably land at Fort Wayne, but that, that was probably the only reason St. Louis over Fort Wayne wasn't anything overly one side or the other. 
but yeah. But well, anyway, yeah. so, so then we got to the seminary. They asked about any special interests. I said no, but my wife likes to sign. They asked if I would mind being assigned going to the deaf church in town for my um, student work program stuff and did that. So that's how I got there. Hmm. Would, would you say that, so you would say that, um, well, my question would be actually, when did when did these um, urgings begin? When did you kind of feel, you said you had kind of been kind of going back and forth with it. So when was the first time you, re you really thought like, I might want to be a pastor someday? It would have been somewhere after the pastor finally started talking about a major church because but somewhere after the pastor talked about it, I I had never really thought about being a church. <laughs> Apparently, we picked the wrong time of the day. But after the pastor talked about it off and on again, it was just one of those, you know, I have always enjoyed doing stuff with the church and at church and being involved. And this just looked like a good opportunity. I loved the job that I had. Right. And probably the only hiccup with the job is my supervisor could not understand where family and church came in because his very first priority always was work right and golf and the bars were the second and third depending on the day so, so he, his his go ahead yeah he, the one thing i was you know interested or that was interesting about that is you didn't really start having any serious thoughts about ministry until after you finished college correct okay so tell me, you went to seminary, and then where was your vicarage at? My vicarage was a deaf vicarage in Toledo, Ohio. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And how was that? How did everything go with the vicarage? Actually, very good. Um, I was the first vicar that this church had ever had, that this pastor had ever had. He was probably as disorganized as I am, <laughs> so we kind of fit together well, and kind of kind of just went through the year trying to figure out what each of us were supposed to be doing and had a blast. You know, I had a similar experience. My my vicar supervisor who ended up being becoming my grandfather, um, he it was his first vicarage too and the church's first vicarage. So there was a learning curve there. The church wasn't really sure what do you do with a vicar? What are you supposed to do? And I of course didn't know what I was doing either. So it was we had to kind of feel each other out for a while and really, really get to know one another. It took some time before I think we really carved out like a role for what the vicar was supposed to be doing. Yeah, and I know the vicar that followed me was extremely organized and stuff, so I'm glad I was first. <laughs> well, there you go. And then you got back to seminary your fourth year, and then where was your first call? It was here to Sioux Falls uh, Deaf Ministry. Really? I, I, I thought you had served maybe one place before you came here. Nope. Nope. I came, I came here, and my office was initially in the district office. Mm -hmm. And then when we built the new building, I moved out there. Now, there was one time where you weren't the pastor of, of Christ, though, right? Where you were just, you were just pastor of Trinity, uh, Trinity Deaf? Correct. That was 93 up until February of 11. And then, uh, and then in, in 2011, you became pastor of Wolf. Correct. So, uh, I typically ask this, and this is a wide open question. I mean it to be, so you're more than welcome to talk about anything. I'm curious, uh, what, what has been your greatest challenges in ministry either right now or in the past or or what you see in the future uh i'd love to hear whatever you had to say about that i don't know if there's any one greatest challenge um it's kind of ebbed and flowed from the beginning mm -hmm. um 
when I got out of the seminary, the call was, I was called through the district and the call was very well defined. It was very, I, I very clearly understood what I, what I was to do, what was expected. And with it being called through the district, the district president is kind of the head person over top of you. And as each district president changes and comes in, the expectations change. So kind of fig figuring out how to work under each different administration has been kind of interesting. And then going into the dual parish has been kind of interesting because it's not a typical dual parish. We're in the same building. Uh, my office is the same place it's always been. And just finding the balance between, between the two congregations at time can be a little bit difficult. And then the other part that kind of through time has been a challenge, it's not as much travel as there used to be, but when I first got in for that first, oh, probably 15 years, there was just a load of travel because I was going out to um, preaching stations. I covered the state of South Dakota. I would go down into Iowa, um, had shut-ins as far as Orange City, Sibley, and then Minnesota up as far as St. Peter. Now, I remember you talked about this. The, your primary traveling was, you were visiting deaf folks, right? And doing- That was that was strictly deaf yeah. at that point, yeah. So you're, when you, you were seen as a resource to, to visit a lot of folks, but unfortunately they were very spread out and you were kind of stretched thin. Correct. Correct. And at that point, there was a pretty good sized group of deaf in Sioux Falls, which there's been some changes since the School for the Deaf closed down their residential program. You know, the, why don't, there's no reason for us to be real strict about our structure. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Okay. Um, after I'd been here for a while, there had been some struggles at the School for the Deaf between the what, what the goal was for it. And then finally, and I can't even remember what it was, they closed down the residential part of the School for the Deaf. Prior to that, I had been able to get youth from the School for the Deaf for a youth program. I would take them on servant event trips every summer and had a pretty good deaf program with the with the youth in the area when they closed down the residential program we lost almost all access to younger deaf because now instead of having one resource you've got to figure out where they all live and they're not all coming back to Sioux Falls they're scattered throughout the state so it's extremely hard to get in touch with them because school districts aren't overly excited about sharing information so that kind of struggled, and, th and this kind of goes into why we went into the dual parish with Christ. But when they closed down the residential part of the school for the deaf, it really changed the perspective or the focus of what I did, because it totally took out that aspect of my ministry. I was um, speaking with uh, a friend of mine from... Uh seminary mark winkleman he's also works within deaf circles in in illinois uh he signs and he's a preacher and uh he he exposed me to some of the realities that deaf folks are one of the last great kind of untapped peoples i mean that's not really true there's lots of peoples that haven't heard the gospel or really haven't heard the gospel preached properly but, but there aren't a lot of people actually reaching out to deaf folks because there's not a lot of people who have the resources to do that. How many, how many churches, like let's say in Sioux Falls, actively have any kind of outreach for deaf ministry? Um, I'd probably say four to five maybe. In town. Which which I'm the only one that has a pastor that signs for the deaf. Most of the, the other ones, if I understand correctly, are all interpreted ministers. Right, okay, yeah. And, and, and that, that's kind of meaningful, isn't it, when the, when the pastor can actually sign himself? It is. Um, it, it avoids a lot of conflict. Just picture yourself 
needing to go in and talk with the pastor, but you have to have a third party in the room. And if it's confidential information, um, it just makes it that much more difficult. I would imagine too, there's a layer of, of interpretation when you're preaching that, you know, an interpreter will make choices as to what words they translate and how they translate. But you probably, when you're writing a sermon, you probably think through kind of how you actually lay down the sign language in order to get your concepts across. Yeah, when, I, when I'm doing a sermon, I do it first and foremost, how is it going to sign? And e even today still, that gets the first focus. And then when I preach it for the hearings church, I make some modifications just because my vocabulary is better in the hearing congregation and concepts are going to be a little bit different how they're going to be understood. You know, it actually brings up a really interesting point too that your wife talked to me about. She talked about hearing people jokes. Maybe you could uh, enlighten our audience as to what a hearing person joke is. You know, you say mine aren't funny, so I don't know. <laughs> But, but it's just once in a while when I have a deaf joke told to me, I, I get it and I, I'll laugh. But even today, I still kind of scratch my head because it's very much an internal type concept of a joke. And kind of like my jokes for you, they're not always that funny. No, but, but what she explained to me was a lot of our comedy as hearing people is is based on word plays, is word puns, Correct, yeah. words rhyming, and deaf people have really zero concept of these jokes. And pastors often, like I have to admit, there have been times where I've, I've based sermons around words or around yep. word plays, and they wouldn't work for a deaf audience. So you must come, you must kind of approach the sermon writing art in a totally different mindset it is and specifically because on my vicarage my wife had to dig me out of a few holes that i dug because they didn't understand my concept of humor just because it was and, a it was a hearing person joke or it was something that yeah didn't, yeah, didn't be, yeah yeah because they 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 didn't catch the subtle um bits of sarcasm or the joke aspect of it. So it didn't take long and I realized I needed to be much more cautious when I bring that type of stuff into the sermon. Yeah, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that uh, trying, you know, sometimes I try to be clever, but being clever is not the same as preaching the gospel. You know? Um, yeah. I think sometimes you, because people listen to your writing product, you feel this urge to write a very uh, high level written product and and you forget that your primary purpose is to preach the gospel. Uh, the words and the concepts, not necessarily in a very ornate and I think we have a duty to write well so that people listen, that so that it engages the, the reader. What I'm saying is sometimes I get off into flights of fancy and try to be cute and that's yeah. not helpful. Well, and I know for myself, when I was doing the sermon specifically for the deaf, it was much more, it was much simpler. And which really, when I started preaching for the hearing congregation, they really appreciated it because it was just very simple to the point. They didn't have to wonder what, is, what was he trying to say there. Right. And... I've never been a real clever individual or anything. Uh, so. Don't be so hard on yourself. And he's yeah. he's 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 uh he tells a lot of jokes at Winkles, and I think yes, I've uh, I've kind of gotten to the point of where I don't I don't laugh at them just to give them a hard time. Hold on for a second. I'm in yeah. the middle of an interview right now. So. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. I was just saying I give you a hard time sometimes because I I, per, I think I purposely choose not to laugh. That's at okay. Time. I'm not funny. Just to give you a hard time about it. That's that's kind of my goal, you know. Wow. See, and my, my wife, when we were first dating, we lived a good distance apart after we'd met. And she assumed my joking that she saw for the time that I was with her would be spread over the whole week. She didn't realize it was a constant diet, so she's more than happy to share me with others. <laughs> You know, your wife is a wonderful lady too. She's 
she's got to be a real tool because she's very well educated in Lutheran theology and she's also a signer. Uh, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but you know, because there are certain words, there's certain grammar and language, as far as I understand the language, that's not really there as opposed to an English or a German or a French. So the, the translation is a big deal, and her having a, a rich library of theological concepts up here has got to help her be an excellent translator. She does a very good job, probably biased opinion, one of the best, especially in the religious aspect. And quite often I will ask her for ideas and clarification on some stuff that I'm doing. You know, maybe, I, I know we're, deep, we're doing kind of a deep dive on this, but I don't know if the regular audience folks who might hear this quite understand. So like, um, could you give an example of how a normal English sentence would translate into sign language, but, but but would kind of be missing some of the pieces we would expect to be there. Okay. I'm going to have an interview with you. That would be the English. Right. I interview you, and I'd have to make sure that the direction was correct, is all that you'd sign. Okay. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So I there's mean, a you, lot of... There's you a throw lot of, out a lot of the little words. But, but it's, you know, the concept is crazy because when you grow up inside that language, you don't understand that you're really missing anything, do you? No, and re reality is you're not because where you and I rely mostly on the words, and we, but we do rely some on body language, um, how loud, how quiet, um, facial expression and stuff. On the deaf side of the world, there are relying on the word but they're putting a lot on body positioning facial expression how big or how small you're signing something to get whether you're happy excited or angry or if it or in those concepts oh, that's fascinating i didn't know that what, what would you say you know maybe going back to the last question what would you say is the biggest challenge of ministry to to uh deaf folks right now Right now, um, probably contact with them, okay. because again, if, if a hearing congregation, you can go out into most neighborhoods if you want to do evangelism that way, knock on doors, send mailings, or whatever, and most of the people that you talk to are going to be hearing and at least have a possibility. If you're doing evangelism in a deaf community, if you don't know where the deaf people live, it's a lot of work just to find one or two deaf people. Right. So just, just the getting in contact with is, is tough. Um, and then once you get in contact with them, depending on what their experience with church has been, they are probably less excited about church than most people that you get in contact with that haven't been in church because most of our people if they've had a contact with church as a child it was probably a hearing congregation mom and dad made them go may or may not have had an interpreter mom and dad may or may not sign so the child just had to be there be quiet don't disrupt and then go home and man, if that was what I had to do, I wouldn't want to go back. No, you, that, that's, that's actually really, you know, it, it, I've thought about ever since I met you and your wife to thinking that uh, trying to learn even a basic, basic rudimentary amount of sign language would be helpful. You just never know who you're going to run into and what they're going to need. Yeah, that's true. Uh, let me ask you this then. Uh, alongside of that, uh, what do you think are the greatest opportunities or greatest joys in ministry right now for you personally, maybe for the whole country, for your tr your congregations, for deaf ministry, however you want to, whatever you want to say there. Greatest joys, greatest opportunities. 
greatest opportunity I'll take first, especially just going through everything we've done with COVID and then with everything else that's happened since then, is being able to focus on a God that you can rely on, a God that doesn't show partiality when it comes to somebody's skin color or where they live or any of those things. Right. We have something to offer that it sounds like everybody's looking for. Yeah. And, it, and in, in a time when there's the fear of becoming ill, we've got something that can give us comfort, even if we were to get sick and if we were to die, we still have a promise to give people that bring hope and comfort during those situations. Awesome. I would agree um, with that greatest, 100%. Yeah. Greatest joy. I've got a cat just jumped on me. Um, greatest joy is just that look on somebody's face when they finally get it. I had back, it was not long after I had been here, there was a couple out of Avon, South Dakota, and a, a deaf couple, a deaf couple. Okay. They traveled either to Sioux Falls or to Sioux City weekly, which is about 100 miles one way. So wow. when we talked about when we talked about my driving an hour to work, this is a couple that drove 100 miles one way so they could be in church. Um, they weren't Lutheran. They finally decided they wanted to become Lutheran. Wow. I drove down there for adult instruction. And as we were going through the creed, the lady just broke down in tears. Really? And I'm sitting here thinking, what did I do this time? <laughs> and she said, no, this is the first time I understood that. And Man doesn't get any more joyful than that. Can I ask what the concept was that she understood? Man, it was long enough ago. <laughs> it was, but no, no. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was third article, and it was just that concept that we cannot, of, of our own ability, believe. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that whole accepting Jesus into our life, life as opposed to no he jumps in both feet and claims us now we can kick try and kick him out but even the concept of him being there wasn't laid upon me yeah you know we i was just talking i on my call right before i came here i was talking with my member about it she was interacting with that and, and i was doing adult education myself this last friday so we were on the third article and and you wouldn't think it would be, but it's a tremendously comforting idea that that the Holy Spirit is the is the worker of faith who works our works out our justification and our sanctification. Um, uh, thanks be to God. Yeah, because as soon as you take it away from that and lay any of it on us, man, it becomes heavy. It, it, it's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, and the only way it's not terrifying is if you're basically lying to yourself. Yeah. I mean, this is the whole basis of the Reformation. This is Luther's struggle right here. Yeah. Well, lying to yourself. And then how can you be sure? Because, you know, I thought I was sure, but today I had a thought or I did something that was wrong. Maybe it's not real. What, and, what, what's enough? Yeah. Exactly. Very good. But I, I think I think we just have such a comfort to offer people that many other religions just don't. You you've got a unique ministry. I can't imagine what it's like. I mean, this sounds very weird to say, but I can't imagine what it's like watching someone who who communicates with their hands cry. Because I have to imagine there's a certain amount of interaction with their hands because they have to actually say yep. the words, too. It's, it's got to be a whole different mm -hmm. process. Yes, it is. You know, and I guess that's probably why they say, that's probably why everyone says that it's not a language, it's a culture. Very much so. I mean, it's just that whole concept of how things fit together 
is is quite a bit different than what it is for you and me. You you must be actually you must feel like you're a pretty unique individual yourself because you live in two cultures. Yeah, um, both with the congregation and now last year we adopted a little deaf child and he was brought into our lives in large part because both my wife and I sign. My wife is much better than I am, but having him in our lives now forces me to be more intentional about my signing and making sure that I pick up on parts of that culture. Well, I, you know, I would love to talk a little bit about this. So, so you, I don't know how much is like uh, common knowledge, what's okay to put out there, but your, your wife is, she moved from being an accountant to a social worker. Well, along the way, she made it there. Uh, she went from being an accountant. While we were at the seminary, she was a nanny. And then when we got on Vicarage and then out of the seminary, she was a uh, sign language interpreter. And then went back to school and got her master's in social work and became a social worker for the Harrisburg School District. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. And so, you know, um, foster care has kind of always been on your guys' horizon. It really has. And even before she got in that direction, because after we got married, uh, we got married, got pregnant right away, lost the child, couldn't get pregnant, uh, went to the seminary, got pregnant again, lost the child. And at that point, we had started looking into foster care and adoption back then. And then we started having children and things went very well. Had our last child that was with us and then got pregnant again, lost a child and said, just getting too old to go through this. And had started talking about the possibility of doing foster care even back then. And the daughter that our last daughter that we birthed alive is 19 and a half now. So we've been talking seriously about it again for the last probably 18 years or so. So so when this boy came to you, it was your first foray back into foster care in a long time. The first official one. We have actually had a few people live with us kind of as foster children, but not officially. Okay. But this, this was the first one that we had to hop through all the hoops to make sure that we were certified and the child was going to be safe with us and everything. So that was that was a bit of a challenge and interesting process in and of itself. Well, and then there were some, um, I don't know, again, you, you tell me what's okay to tell and what's okay to talk about, but there were some developmental delays due to the fact that he was deaf. Um, some because he was deaf, but also just because language was not introduced to him until he was over five or just right at five years old. So he had zero language up until then. Um, even functionally as far as walking and stuff was not capable or taught how to do that until way late. His, he's ha has some physical challenges that seem to be coming around, but will probably mean later in his life but much sooner than normal he's going to have to have some hip surgeries and stuff but his language is is almost nil and working on that has been a challenge but he has picked it up and as he picks up more and more you can see him move forward in some of his other areas that he's been delayed well i i have to say from the outside looking in in the few times i've got to see you with him i've just been absolutely floored at the development how he how quickly he is coming around you know and just growing and every time i see him he's he's doing more he's saying more he's better behaved it's unreal i'm re i'm really proud of both of you and it's a wonderful thing you're well, thank doing you. thanks be to god for you I don't know if another couple could have pulled that off, so. I'm sure there are, um, but we just happen to be the ones where he landed. You know, we we uh, uh, we just started again with foster care as well, and um, 
it's been uh, I wouldn't say challenging, not yet anyway, but it's been uh, uh, a little bit of work, a little more, a little more work than I was expecting. But it's also been there's been a lot of joys along the way. You know, I I've always been someone to encourage people to think about foster care, to do foster. You know, if you really want to, if you really want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's no better way than to provide a safe home. And, and a loving home to kids that need a home, and, and perhaps even adoptuskids.org. You know, I know that your, do- your wife yeah. has been putting out profiles of kids that want to be adopted as well, and it's so sad. I mean, you've got 15, 16-year-old kids, 17-year-old kids. All they want is someone to give them a home, like a place where they can feel safe and a place they can feel loved. They're not asking for money. They're not asking for for game systems, possessions, or phones. They just want someone to tell them they love them and provide a safe place. I would love to hear your thoughts on foster care, uh, you know, maybe just to an audience that doesn't know a lot about okay. it. Okay. Well, um, we just had a new 16-year-old boy move in with us today, and he's been at our house the last three weekends, but today he becomes permanent. So. He will have challenges as far as school, getting used to us. Um, We are a bit of a noisy family for having deaf people involved with us. We are a big family. And when he first came, the first weekend he came to visit us, most of our children were here. Fortunately for him, most of them have left. (laughs) So it is a bit quieter today than it has been even the last couple days. But there's just a huge need. It's a, I see it as an opportunity to put your faith into action for others. Um, one of the biggest issues societally that we have, I think, is the whole abortion issue. Yeah. And we, 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 we can say you shouldn't do it. We should, can say this, that, and the other thing. But everybody keeps pointing out, yeah, but what do we do with all the kids? Well, sometimes we have to step forward and say, you know what, I'm willing to help take care of them. Yeah, and exactly right. What, and whether it's going to be a child that we wind up adopting, our younger child that is deaf, or this child, we have no idea. The issue, the issue of adoption has been brought up to him by his social worker, and he said, well, it's a little too early for that. And that will be totally in his ballpark. If he decides somewhere between now and when he moves out that he wants to go forward with adoption, we are all all for that. But it has to be his decision. But we also have to be open to it, and we are. I've uh, I've run into this. I've I've commended many people in my congregation to think about doing foster care, and ultimately it's, well, that's okay for you. You're young. You can still do it, or... Um, you have the heart for it or you want to do it. And ultimately, it, it comes down to uh, people have their life. They don't want it, whatever is that kind of that, that small idol in their life. They don't want it to be disturbed. And so they don't want to kind of commit to caring for someone. But, you know, we sometimes I think we, we pay lip service to the gospel that we, we believe. We we love it when Christ is speaking to us the words of gospel, but then when we, you know, perhaps we can go out into our neighborhood, our community, and and show and preach those same words to others, we're not so willing to do that. Um, yeah. It really, foster care is literally one of the, if, if you're really serious, you're like, I really want to reach out with the gospel, foster care is one of the absolute easiest ways you could possibly do it because those kids, mm-hmm. they got to go to church with you, they got to listen yep. to what you have to do. They, they'll listen to you when you speak devotions at night, when you're doing devotion on dinner table. Um, the state, for the most part, helps you defray the cost of doing foster care. It's a matter of do you want your life to be inconvenienced or not? Yep. And, and what is a bit of inconvenience in this life for the possibility that those kids that you care for might be with you for all eternity? It's not, it's not, even, it's not even equal. It's... It, it's it's, it's, it's a small, small price to pay. Well, and I know you said that they, they say to you, but you're young. I'm not. Amen. In fact, 
in, in fact, our youngest, if everything goes well, this is, this is what I tell people I told our children when we were looking at adopting. If everything goes well, we'll be about 70 when he graduates from high school. If it doesn't, we'll be dead and you'll be taking care of him. And the reality is we were empty nesters officially for about a month before we adopted him. <laughs> And so our last child had graduated from high school, had been accepted into college. We went on a family vacation, came back, and went, finished off the adoption of our youngest. So you give up some things, but man, you get a whole bunch more. I agree. You know, you might have you might have less money and less time to do the things that make you happy, but you're going to find so much joy that it's gonna outweigh that. You know, happiness is fleeting. Happiness is going out for for dinner one night. Happiness is going on that vacation to Vegas or whatever. But joy, true joy of watching a child grow under your under your leadership, in your household, like olive shoots around your table, that is something that is yours forever. And it's not without frustration, just like the rest of our children. Yeah. But the goal is is that even through the frustrations, you see the positive influence that has been laid before that child, again, just like your own children. Because now our youngest is our own child. This other one that just moved in, God willing, someday will be our own child. Matthew Nix, you are a good man, and I'm glad I know you. So well, thank you. I have some rapid fire questions, some fun questions that I'll give you. Um, what is your favorite movie? I'll be real honest. I don't know that I have one. Give me, uh, give me one that might make it into your top five. Um, our youngest daughter, back from college last night, had my wife and I sit down with her and watch My Girl. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Sad. It is. Yeah, so it is my life. <laughs> okay. Uh, favorite book of the Bible or favorite Bible verse? I'll take either one. Um, I like Genesis because it lays down that whole foundation that most anybody that has a religious background has to lead. I mean, whether it's Lutheran or Christian even or not, has to has to kind of go back to and then you can come forward through christianity that was a really interesting answer i did not expect that but you know i have to kind of agree that there are a lot of really important theological concepts laid down in the first 10 chapters of genesis it's it's yeah. a heavy book the other option was going to be matthew just because they named it after me well there you go matthew's a good book did, hey did you get the brand did you get the last the last one of the Gibbs commentary series now? I have not got the second half of it. There's three, I think, actually. Oh, yeah. then I haven't got the, the second two-thirds of it. Right. There's uh, 11, uh, 1 through 11, then 11 through 20, and then 20 through 28. And I got the third well, one. I got it right here. And uh, it is fantabulous. Well, you just have to make sure we have all three of them by Fall Pastors Conference and have them sign them. Yeah. Th yes. This is good. This is most certainly good. Okay. Um, a recent book you enjoyed reading? Um, I'll be honest. I haven't done much reading for enjoyment other than just work stuff. Yeah, I understand. So. Uh, one, of the, one of the recent books I read was, uh, I read that 12, 12 um, that Jordan Peterson book. Okay. Yeah, that was that was pretty good. I've been kind of working. I'm actually thinking about. I've got a guys group. I'm thinking about maybe taking them through it. Oh. It's not necessarily Christian, but yeah. um, definitely some interesting concepts in there. So. Yep. Well, um, we have had a group that's done some Walter readings here re the last couple of years, and those have been fun. They those have been good. I haven't been nearly as much as you have been to those, but those, every time I went, they were very interesting. I even bought the one for last time. Uh, All glory to God. Yep. But I, I have. Yep. I haven't done much with it. Um, favorite food? 
Pizza. Yes, because we had pizza. You know what? And we had pizza at Old Chicago, and that's closed now, isn't it? It is. Yeah, that's a bummer. I know a lot but of people. The building still sits empty. Yeah, I knew a lot of people who were bummed about that for my congregation, too. They really liked Old Chicago because they had the wide variety of beers there and then good yep. pizza. Yep. I can't I can't understand why they closed. They, it seems like it was a fairly successful business. My understanding is they had a lease that came up and they were changing the price on it because oh. they were hoping to be able to do, I'm assuming, with the mall that's going in there where the Ford dealership used to be. Right. But... The reality is, it has now sat and empty for about two years. Yeah, not a good choice the, by the, the by the leasees or the the, uh, the owners. The you owners. would you would have thought you they they have said you know what let's sign a lease until we'll guarantee you until we get it started and they could have at least been bringing income in for that period of time. Right. You know this uh, the same thing happened at Fairway. I, I if I recall correctly is that uh, the Fairway grocery store they changed their rate yep. and that's why they moved. So, okay, uh, last uh, uh, last couple quick questions. Cat or dog? Cat. All right. And one place that you'd really like to visit? Uh, I'd like to go back to Alaska. Oh. Yeah. I, I, I want to get there once before I die, too. I, I, it sounds like Laura's not a cold climate person, but I'd like to go see Alaska. Yeah. Went there as a little bitty kid and just would like to go back and do have more fun with it oh well uh pastor nicks i i thank you so much for sitting with me and doing an interview today and and uh you know the lord bless your work i think you're doing really important work out there and uh, may he prosper it and bless it i'm going to keep you in my prayers uh with with all the things going on especially with uh, the possible adoptions and whatnot going on in your life so i'll i'll definitely keep my prayers for that stuff but Thanks so much for sitting down with us. I appreciate it very much. Okay, my pleasure. You have a great day, and blessings on the children you're taking care of there, both your own and the foster kids. Appreciate it, sir. Have a great day. Okay, thank you much.